Cole made modern mass democracy possible. We usually associate the rise of democracy with new ideas, with people becoming more enlightened. I think there's a better explanation of it uh, if one looks closely at the role of coal and the role of energy more generally in what made democracy possible and also what limited it later on. So with the rise of coal, and particularly with the extended use of coal in the late 19th century, when it started to be used for generating electricity as well as a source of heat or as uh, industrial power, one had societies, particularly in Northern Europe, that were dependent on a single source of energy for vast amounts of their energy needs. It was the first time in history that one had a situation like that because before that the supply of energy was much more dispersed. It came from forests, it came from grasslands that fed animals, it came from food that supplied human energy. All those exist, but coal increases the source of energy so much that one has a single source that is of enormous importance. And that coal, that source of energy, runs along fairly narrow supply routes. It comes from certain places underground, the coal face, and then it's moved by rail and by water to the places where it's used, power stations and uh, sites of industry and large cities. What that meant is not only dependence on a single source of energy, but a source of energy that is vulnerable to disruption because those routes uh, have certain key points where the flow can be interrupted. So, for example, at the coal face itself, um, at the docks where the coal is loaded onto, onto, onto barges or ships and, and at the power stations where a lot of the coal is used. The result of that was that for the first time in history it's possible for workers to shut down uh, the energy system of an entire country, something never been possible before when you had those much more distributed sources of energy typically used much more locally. That ability to shut down came to be called the general strike. It was actually or almost always a key alliance between the coal workers, uh, the dock workers, and, uh, and workers on the railroads who moved, uh, who moved the coal. And simply by coordinating their industrial action, this interruption to the supply of energy, to an economy, to a country, could be, uh, could be compromised. As a result of that, for the first time, the demands of ordinary people, workers, for a whole set of basic protections of, of, of their mode of existence, so the right to some kind of protection in old age, the right to uh, health insurance, or the right to uh, education for their children, the right to minimum wages, all those demands which had been around for a long time, they had to be met for the first time. Demands also for uh, the right to unionize, the right to, um, to vote, and in, in Parliament. And that's where you find, I think, the origins of mass democracy, somewhere between the 1880s uh, and the period between the wars and, and after the Second World War. Now, not every country followed the same path, and there were some where uh, those who resisted the demands of mass democracy put up more resistance, and you see paths towards fascism and other consequences that are not democratic. But even in those places, eventually, uh, these forms of mass democracy reemerge. If coal made mass democracy possible, then oil set its limits. And you can begin to understand that again at, at a technical level of how energy is produced and distributed. And the difference with oil is that first of all it came second. So there was a second major source of energy rather than a single dominant source of energy. And that in itself weakens the ability of those to interrupt energy supply when coal is the single dominant source. And the, the second thing about oil is that it was largely produced elsewhere. The centers of industrial society that emerged in the 19th century were close to supplies of coal. In most places they were not close to supplies of oil, which for geological reason, reasons was largely found in, in other parts of the world. The U.S. is an exception to that, but certainly that, that is the European story. So it had to travel over much greater distances once oil becomes a second major source of, of carbon energy. But it's also different in its, its physical properties. So whereas to produce coal you need to send a labor force underground and you need then a large amount of labor to load it and to move it and to put it to use. Oil comes out of the ground under its own pressure. It's usually a liquid. The labor force stays on, on the surface 
and uh, is therefore under the supervision of management and of police and other forces, uh, doesn't have the same independence. And then as a liquid, uh, it can be moved much more easily. It can be moved in pipelines uh, to the terminals at, at the coast, and then it can be moved in tankers. So again, smaller workforces and less easy for those uh, workforces to uh, interrupt the supply because there are not so many critical points of loading, of unloading, and where they are, uh, they become easier to, to police and control. The other thing is that because the oil is largely moved by sea, once it's been loaded onto tankers, it can be routed more flexibly. Uh, coal tended to go on very fixed routes, the fixed routes of rail lines, on a route that took it between two fixed points, a point of production to a point of use. And you can think of it as a sort of tree-like distribution system with a, with a big trunk and then branches at each end. Whereas oil you can think of more like a, a network distribution where once it's at sea it can flow to many different directions, different ports, different places of use so that if a particular site in the distribution of energy is interrupted by strikes, of labor actions, democratic claims, the energy can be easily rerouted to another destination or to another port. That flexibility of the network of a, of a seaborne distribution of energy makes it more difficult uh, to interrupt the flow of energy, in addition to the fact that one now has a great distance between where the energy is produced, for example, typically in the Middle East, one of the major producing centers, and where it's used, which tends to be largely in the industrialized countries that first uh, developed with the energy from coal. The new energy systems based on oil had workforces that, like those based on coal, made a set of political demands. And you can go back to the 1920s and 1930s in Iran and Iraq, or the 1940s and 1950s in Saudi Arabia, and you will find workers organizing, uh, developing labor unions, and making political demands initially over working conditions, housing, um, rights of various sorts at the place of work, but increasingly much broader political demands uh, that unions be recognized nationally, political parties, constitutions. You have Saudi workers in the 1950s demanding a political constitution, uh, for example. The difference being not in, in the demands compared to uh, what one saw with the rise of coal, but the inability to threaten energy supply in the same way because of the different uh, aspects of the distribution. That doesn't mean the supply of energy is no longer interrupted under oil. It's rather a question of who can do the interrupting. And it tends to be that the interrupting, the sabotaging of energy supply once one shifts to, to one that uses oil as well as coal. In the case of oil, is actually in the hands not of workers, but, but of oil companies. And uh, they actually organize on a scale that it, you can think of as a parallel to, but opposite to the way in which coal workers were able to uh, organize. That is to say, they coordinate, uh, not on a national scale as coal workers were able to do, or those involved in coal supply were able to do, but on the scale at which oil is moved, which is a, which is a global scale. And they create, as the form of that organization, the International Oil Company, which is needed not because oil is expensive to produce, but because that is the scale on which it's possible to control the flow of energy, not by the workers, who are to split up by the, the, the global layout of energy production, but by the companies. And what they can use that power to interrupt the supply of energy to do is to increase its price and increase their profits. And so one sees in the history of the oil industry from early in the 20th century, right through uh, in some ways till today, but especially until the 1970s, the role of international oil companies working to restrict the, ply, the supply of oil in order to make extraordinary profits. So it was costing them just pennies to produce oil in the Middle East and they were uh, selling it at something like a hundred times that price of two dollars a barrel when it might cost only two cents to produce it. And you have an extraordinary system of profits based on that power of sabotage, that ability to interrupt the supply of oil. Now, in order to do that, you've got to be in a position to control oil at every point, at the point of production, the point of distribution, the point of refining, and so on. And as far as possible, what the large oil companies aimed to do was to bring all of that 
under a single system of control. Now that meant oil wells, pipelines, loading points, refineries, and down to refineries and points of distribution. Of course, it also meant the seaborne. Um, movement of oil and the large oil companies also developed their own tanker fleets for that purpose or they worked in alliance and sometimes some kind of financial struggle with other large shipping companies that um, arranged the movement of oil. Of course the tankers got larger and larger which um, again reduced the relative role of the labor force and the inability of labor to interrupt. The loading and unloading was increasingly uh, almost from the start was mechanized and the labor that was employed at sea was outside the reach of national labor laws so that whereas in the case of coal because of the domestic national space of the movement once workers were able to unionize they could claim a whole set of rights and improvements to living conditions. Oil is moved at sea and it becomes much harder because those ships then fly under so-called flags of convenience. Um, countries uh, that do not have labor laws or do not apply them to the ships that are registered. And that, again, weakens the ability of a labor force to organize and to interrupt or make demands in relation to the flow of energy.